Welcome everyone to today's webinar, the Birch Work Study 2016, Salaries of Data Scientists. We're excited that you could join us to hear the results of our most recent salary study. Today we'll be sharing the updated demographic and compensation data on the nation's hottest career field, data science. And with nearly 400 regist registrants as of a few minutes ago, I think everyone here agrees that this is quite a popular topic. My name is Katie Prezis, and I'm the Director of Research and Operations at Birchworks. Before I hand things off to our speakers, I want to quickly share some logistics for today. First, only our presenters will be able to speak, so your phone lines and microphones are muted. That being said, please do not be shy. We'll have plenty of time today for questions at the end of our presentation. I'll be collecting those questions via the chat function located on the left side of your screen. Feel free to submit your questions for Linda and Adam throughout the talk. While we anticipate a flawless event, if you experience any technical issues, you can submit those through chat as well, and our team will do its best to swiftly resolve any problems you might be experiencing. Finally, today's session is being recorded and will be available on our website along with the full Birchwork Study Report, which will be available on our website right after today's event. That's birchworks.com study. I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers, who I'm sure many of you already know and have maybe even spoken with recently. First, Linda Birch, who is Birchworks Managing Director. Linda's been recruiting in analytics for over 30 years and holds a degree in industrial engineering and operations research in addition to an MBA. She started her career on the corporate side with Pepsi and Whirlpool before landing in executive recruiting. Also joining us today is Adam Flugel, Birchworks Data Science Recruiter. Adam has been recruiting exclusively for data science roles for several years now, and he's worked with clients and candidates in industries ranging from retail to video gaming to cancer treatment. Before joining the Birchworks team, he received his bachelor's degree at Cornell University. Both Linda and Adam have been actively involved in the data science community, including giving presentations to data science and analytics programs at universities such as Northwestern and Loyola. Linda has been a member of the American Statistical Association and INFORMS for years, and Adam attends ASA events and data science meetups regularly, including a trip to Boston to present last year's study to the local community. Birchworks has been repeatedly mentioned in the popular press regarding data science talent trends in publications such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, CNBC, Information Week, the Chicago Tribune, Mashable, and the list goes on and on. Today we're excited to share our latest data. Linda, I'll let you take things from here. Thanks, Katie, and welcome, everybody. Well, as, as Katie mentioned, this is our third consecutive year that we've published our data science salary study. Um, and many of you may be familiar also with our predictive analytics uh, salary study that we published every fall. Uh, early on, we decided to break out data science because it was pretty clear to us that the backgrounds are different. Uh, there's, of course, more of an uh, emphasis on computer science in the case of data scientists. Uh, and the salaries also were significantly different. So that's why uh, we have uh, two of these webinars a year, one focused on data science, and then in the fall, the predictive analytics professionals. So uh, now we all know that enthusiasm for data-driven strategy has um, a continued to increase, and it's obviously evidenced by the 400-some uh, uh, registrants that we have today. Um, Many of you are likely familiar with some of the effects that this has had on the hiring market of late. Um, let me first touch on some of the use cases. Um, many of you are familiar with sensor data being, sensor data being used in, uh, with manufacturing equipment. Uh, it's pretty much routine now and used for identifying preventive maintenance schedules. Also, uh, casinos use real-time customer information to optimize um, on the floor or playing time of their guests. And then that goes hand in hand actually with um, video games uh, and video gaming companies that track player behavior on a uh, live and continuous basis to order, in order to improve engagement and keep people um, online longer. And of course, we're all familiar with personalized advertising and targeting. 
So no surprise, uh, the popularity of the discipline of data science as well as the title data scientist has resulted in the term being uh, oftentimes uh, overused and often abused. Uh, you see it all over resumes and job titles, and of course it's plastered all over LinkedIn. And this is something that gets really, really extreme at times. Um, so I've seen data scientist jobs uh, posted on Indeed or LinkedIn where the only technical requirement is some experience with Excel. Um, I've seen some really odd things kind of labeled as data science, data scientist. Um, so it really is uh, pretty crazy how widely the term is used in some settings. Uh, but we have a very, very specific definition uh, which I'll actually get to in a little bit here. Yeah, thanks Adam for that. I mean the stories that we could tell you is pretty extraordinary. So anyway, keep in mind too that we personally interview each data scientist that was included in the study so we can um, evaluate everybody on whether they actually have the requisite skills as well as whether or not they are really in a data science role. Uh, so we, what we don't do is rely on self-reporting like so many other surveys do. So as a result, I am very confident that this information that we give you is, a, a, is an accurate picture of the data science community. So something that we noticed um, that started a couple of years ago was the influx of young professionals into this field. Uh, and it's certainly uh, seen a pickup over the last year too. And so this has resulted in several shifts in the demographic attributes of early career data scientists. And I want to get into that in a little bit more detail uh, later on in the talk. Now lots and lots of people of, of course are very interested in this field. And I would even say uh, that the label nerd, which used to be a negative, is now more of a badge of honor. So no wonder data science continues to show up at the top of career choices on so many, many lists. And actually we um, just the other day had a uh, dad of someone who is in high school emailing us. I think they were just starting out freshman year um, asking about how they could position themselves to get into data science because they had been reading about it and the kid was really, really interested in it. Um, so this is going very, very early on. People are, are starting to catch on and, and want to be a data scientist when they grow up. Yeah, and I just love it because so many of my candidates tell me that their um, sons and daughters are studying mathematics or statistics. In fact, my daughter is, um, is in, in, uh, in mathematics minoring in um, statistics. So um, anyway, enough with this introduction. Uh, let's dig into some data. So again, uh, this is our third study. Um, and in it we're going to share tons of data. So compensation and demographic information across uh, a variety of categories, um, base salaries and bonuses of course, um, as well as aligning that with the level of experience and whether or not uh, the person is in a managerial role or an individual contributor role. Also uh, where people live uh, and what types of organizations they work for. Uh, their residency status, their gender, as well as their educational background. So we had um, uh, complete information on 374 data scientists uh, for this year's study. Now of course we know many um, thousands more than that, um, but what we do, what, what we limit our study to people that we have complete information on. So, um, and that's why we have uh, this, this study is, is of 374 people. So here's what we're going to cover today. First, how do we define and identify data scientists as well as let's talk a little bit about their demographic profile, what they look like. Um, and then we're going to get into salaries um, and where they are today and how they've changed. Um, then we're going to highlight a couple of interesting insights that came out of this year's data. Um, and then after that, um, I'll close the formal part of the webinar with some thoughts that I have on maybe where all of this might be leading. Uh, but last um, and never least, 
Adam and I will be available to take your questions. And, and that's my favorite part of the presentation, so don't be shy. Please send your questions to Katie as you think of them along the way here. So now I'm going to pass things over to Adam, who knows this talent pool like the back of his hand. Adam? Thank you, Linda. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Adam. For the last two years now, uh, I have spent every waking moment of my life identifying data scientists 24-7 um, every day. All right. That, that might be exaggerating a little bit, um, but I am a recruiter who works exclusively on data science roles. Uh, so this is something that I do spend kind of a disturbing amount of time thinking about. Um, data science it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, uh, but we, like I said earlier, we stick to a very distinct definition. Um, and it's this very uh, kind of valiant and noble adherence to this uh, strict code and this definition that really sets this report apart from a lot of others. Um, I kind of think of it like this. Uh, without a specific definition, data scientist as a term is really just going to become the next uh, synergy or another kind of big buzzword. Um, and obviously there is something distinct about these people. They, they get you know, a different price tag. Um, so it, it's a big field, uh, but it does have a distinct definition. So uh, now that I've sort of talked up this definition of ours, what is it? Also, just to add to that, Adam, you know, we have uh, discussions, sort of, uh, sort of casual discussions, sometimes heated discussions about um, a, a specific people that we're talking to or organizations that we're working with on uh, whether or not the, the sort of candidate or client uh, or, or job opening actually does uh, or can be classified as a true data scientist. You know, those lines are starting to blur now into predictive analytics professionals. So it will continue to get fuzzier as time goes on, I think. Oh, definitely. Um, and we'll talk, I'll actually talk a little bit more about that when we talk about tools um, and how that's kind of blending in some ways. Uh, but anyhow, um, getting to this definition, data scientists are predictive analytics professionals. Obviously there is more to this, uh, but I did want to emphasize that because first and foremost, uh, the foundation of data science really is still predictive analytics. Um, and that would be deriving quantitative insights to guide business practices. Uh, and that could be statistical modeling, machine learning algorithms, but it's still that quantitative predictive analytics. Um, of course, the other aspects to this are um, one of the biggest aspects would be general purpose coding and programming skills. Uh, so a, a true data scientist really has an intimate understanding of the logic and the mindset behind programming. Um, I say that because a common trap that a lot of recruiters fall into is this tendency to categorize based on tools used. Um, but it's really the skills behind the tools that matters. Uh, compared to the fundamental knowledge behind programming, learning the syntax of, of one new language or another, uh, it's about as difficult as um, I guess it's about as difficult as learning to wear a hat. Uh, as always, I'm not exaggerating at all with that. <laughs> um, but when I, when I say that you need to understand how these tools are used, um, this goes back to the blurred lines. A lot of predictive analytics professionals who don't necessarily have general coding knowledge um, are using R or Python packages that are more analytical. Uh, that doesn't mean they could code a whole program or anything, but they're using these tools that some people might see and say, oh, data scientist. Um, but it really depends on how they're used. Um, all right, so let's move on here. There is more to this definition. Um, another big aspect of data scientists is the ability to work with a variety of data sources. Uh, so that does include, obviously, relational databases, sort of the more traditional uh, things like SQL. Um, and then, of course, all of the non-relational big data technologies that everyone talks about when they talk about data science, uh, things like Hadoop, Spark, um, and you know, whatever the next five tools that come out in the next month are to replace everything that's already there. So that's one of the important aspects of, um, uh, that people need to remember um, if they're in the quantitative business sciences, and that's 
that everything is changing, and it's changing quickly. So it's not about you know, whether or not you're great at um, SAS coding today. It's really about what's coming down the line and making sure that you keep your tools um, up to date and um, your skill set um, um, marketable. Definitely. Um, and uh, on top of sort of these, these hard technical skills here, um, I want to talk about one thing that might be a little redundant uh, since this one really should be part of Predictive Analytics Professional uh, as that baseline. But it does bear repeating, business acumen is so, so, so important for a data scientist. Uh, a data scientist really needs to understand the priorities of the business. That way all their impressive technical skills can serve a really practical purpose. Uh, so you know all these really technical feats of analytical wizardry, uh, they might astonish and amaze, but unfortunately gasps and applause are not factored into ROI. Um, so if your company does just want to shock and awe with no uh, real practical application, I think it would be much cheaper and probably more effective to hire a magician. Um, which gives me a chance to plug this. Later this year, tune in for the Birchworks Salary Study for Stage Magicians. Not really, not really. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately I am joking about that. Um, uh, uh, but I will say that you know, the, the business acumen part of things, that is the number one complaint or concern that I hear from clients. So it's very important to uh, make sure you're always talking about uh, the context and how um, uh, how the, the value you bring to the organization um, will impact their bottom line. And if you're a student, keep that in mind. Look for internships. If you're evaluating programs, look for ones with real industry connections. As much real industry work as you can do uh, obviously will help you in that respect. Um, all right, so this is what data scientists are, uh, but let's get into what they do with all of this. Um, they obviously do a lot. That's why they get paid so much. Uh, that's why they need such deep knowledge in complex fields, multiple complex fields. That's also why this definition keeps going on and on. Um, but to get a little more reckless here, here's my very uh, simplistic version of how we define this. Data scientists do predictive analytics work using messy, real-time, really big, unstructured data, any of that difficult data. Um, so just wanted to emphasize this piece further, the unstructured data, and a little bit more emphasis. Um, I know this is a huge simplification, but if I had to pick a single dividing line between predictive analytics and data science, uh, this would probably be it. Um, it's really the data they're working with, working the full cycle, um, and not needing a data engineer or anything like that to get things structured. Uh, what's most important in this definition is really what they do do. Um, so that, that is what defines a data scientist. Obviously if you can do all the work required of a data scientist, then you're a data scientist. Um, so this next part, I'm going to talk about education here. Um, this is more what we see in the field, how most data scientists tend to learn this stuff. Um, but it, again, the definition is about what they can do. So due to this really high bar of all these tasks and tools and skills, obviously the vast majority of data scientists do have significant formal training. Um, you know, there are always exceptions. One data scientist that I can think of, uh, he ended his formal education with a high school diploma. Um, so I talked to him just a couple weeks ago. Um, he has launched multiple companies. He's patented even more technologies than that. Um, and again, just as a high school diploma. But that is one guy. Uh, it's the only example I can think of after talking to more than a million data scientists, if not more than a billion. Um, and of course these are literal figures. I am not exaggerating. Um, at this point, most data scientists do have an education from a more traditional uh, university, you know, an accredited university, getting a degree in stats, computer science, maybe multiple degrees. Um, but the last few years there have been a lot of emerging options. Uh, so first, sort of straddles the line between traditional and new master's programs in data science and predictive analytics with a data science bend are really popping up all over the place at uh, accredited universities. Uh, the quality is going to vary based on the program, obviously, but in the best cases these really do a good job of teaching the right skills, uh, getting their students internships and industry experience 
and they produce hireable entry-level data scientists, uh, which is affecting the demographics, and we'll talk about that later. Um, boot camps are another big thing in the education space for data science. These are really all over the board. Uh, some of them miss the board entirely. A few landed on the floor. Some of them are on the bathroom mirror. Uh, they're really all over the place. Um, so a few of them are uh, really great, and, and you know there are some really solid programs out there that will produce hireable data scientists. But you do need a background in quant and, and programming and sort of those fundamental baseline knowledge to, to make that work. So good for career transitions, good for breaking into data science from an academic background, uh, but you can't go from scratch. Finally, MOOCs are a good learning tool here and there uh, for dipping your toes. I just haven't seen any MOOCs that can really impart the fundamental knowledge of stats or programming that you need. So maybe for a tool here or there, or learning in an unofficial capacity, a MOOC can be great, uh, but they don't really have the weight needed to land a job in the space. Um, again, I don't like defining data scientists by tools, um, but everyone's always interested in what tends to be used out there. Uh, so these are not diagnostic criteria. These are just the tools that we do see data scientists using regularly. Um, so some key components to point out real quick. Obviously, if analytics is, is sort of this key piece, every data scientist is going to have something like uh, R, occasionally SAS. Um, even Python now is used for analytics, something for predictive modeling analytics. Um, and again, R and Python are the most often used. Um, another big piece is at least one general purpose coding language. Python is really the big one on the market, uh, but we also see Java, C, C++, and a bunch of others. Um, of course, as I mentioned, SQL, relational databases, as well as uh, Hadoop, Spark, big data infrastructures. Um, and as a general rule for all of this, the more tools the better, the more databases the better. There are a lot of fields that do touch on data science or have one piece or another, maybe the coding without the quant, the quant without the coding. Um, but a true data scientist needs the whole package. Uh, this slide is just an example of some of those mislabeled data science rules that we see sometimes. All right, so we've gone through this sort of abstract definition of a data scientist, but who are the people that are actually doing this work? Um, start out here, we're going to look at the job level breakdown. Uh, so let me quickly explain how we broke this down. Um, first, we assigned each professional to a job category. These are really broad categories. There's only two of them, and uh, it's individual contributor or manager. Um, so then we break these ICs and MGs into three levels each. Uh, here is the individual contributor breakdown. This one's very straightforward. It's based on years of experience. Um, the manager levels are a little bit more nuanced. Uh, so these are dependent upon more of a holistic evaluation of both the person's primary responsibilities and the number of people they manage. So let's get the glaringly obvious out of the way. No surprise here. There are more individual contributors in data science than there are managers. Data scientists also tend to skew young. We don't ask our candidates ages, um, but as you can imagine, years of career experience is very strongly correlated with age. Um, and with all the hype, we're actually seeing more and more people at the entry level. So this trend really shows no signs of stopping anytime soon. Um, another big shocker, data scientists are well educated. 92% of them have advanced degrees, um, and nearly half of them have PhDs which is higher than uh, the PhD percentage that we see in the other predictive analytics professionals that we work with. In terms of educational focus, data scientists generally come from quantitative educational fields. Um, so this should come as no surprise. Quant skills are the core of data science. Um, the third most common area of study is computer science which speaks to the other primary component of data science, uh, that programming knowledge that I keep harping on about. When it comes to residency status, almost a third of data scientists are not U.S. citizens. Uh, so if you can sponsor, keep this in mind, hiring managers. It will open up your talent pool. Um, there have been actually some pretty big shifts in this chart over the last year. Um, but I'm going to leave that as a cliffhanger that Linda can address later. Uh, so stay on the edges of your seats for that. 
um, data scientists tend to flock to the coasts. Um, obviously, that's where all the big data science meccas are, Boston, New York, um, and obviously San Francisco. Uh, in fact, the West Coast alone had a whopping 43% of the data scientists in our sample this year. Um, looking at what industries employ data scientists, tech is still far and away number one. Uh, it's almost half of the sample, uh, more than I think second through sixth place combined. Um, marketing services has stayed high in the rankings as well. Um, and then sort of a new shift, just recently financial services has climbed up near the top thanks to all the emerging wonders of the FinTech world. Um, so here is our bummer statistic of the day for me to end my section on. Um, only 16% of the data scientists in our sample this year were women. Uh, if you can believe it, this is actually a shift in the right direction over last year and a significant one. Uh, so in 2011, that number was 11%. That is nearly a 50% increase this year in the proportion. Um, not that I have to do that math for any of you that are listening, I'm sure. Um, so this stat, it really it could be a bigger bummer, but obviously this is a far cry from balanced. Um, so hopefully we still see this positive shift, and hopefully it uh, accelerates a little bit. Um, all right, so I know I just droned on for an hour and a half here, um, but you've done your time, so let's get to what you're really after, that sweet, sweet moolah. All right, I'm going to pass this back to Linda now so you don't have to hear any more phrases like that. Um, back to you, Linda. Well, thanks, Adam. Um, I am uh, not nearly as entertaining as Adam is, so I have to make up for that with interesting content. So let's talk about salaries. So what are we seeing here? Salaries are still increasing for the most part. Uh, but they have started to level off a bit. So in, in nearly every uh, job category, we saw single-digit increases compared to last year's figures. This chart shows um, uh, some of the details. The largest increase was seen among the Level 1 individual contributors, the IC1 group here, whose salaries rose by 7%, so up to 97,000 base. Uh, this is definitely cooling down from last year's 14% year-over-year increase. Now the salaries at Level 2 and Level 3 for individual contributors remained fairly steady in this last year. Now taking a look at the manager side, salaries there had mixed results and generally pointed to a leveling off. So at Level 1, salaries were basically consistent with last year. Uh, the Level 2 managers saw um, a small increase of about 3% over last year's numbers. Um, and at the executive level, we saw a slight dip. Um, and although we can probably attribute that to um, the smaller sample size at the MG3 level, um, clearly uh, those salaries have not uh, been escalating. They've been staying pretty flat or pretty consistent. So um, here's the pattern over the last three years for you to take a quick look at. And then the next slide shows the trend um, as a percentage. Now let's take a look at the manager side. Here are the numbers. And then here they are represented as a percent change. So as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, uh, data scientists are different. Um, and when we compare data science salaries to those of other analytics professionals, the data scientists continue to earn more as this chart shows. So for individual contributors in data science, they are paid up to about 39% more than their predicted analytics counterparts. And on the manager side, the difference is smaller, um, but clearly it's uh, still there. Um, at level one and two, managers earn 12% more in data science. Um, at, MG, at the MG3 level, the executive level, uh, you can see that it's kind of flattened out where um, um, leadership skills uh, become much more important. 
So there were a couple of very interesting findings that stood out to us this year, and it, and it happened very quickly over 12, uh, or during this 12-month period. The most interesting involved the demographic shifts that happened uh, at, uh, primarily at the most junior levels. So first, um, we found that at the early career level, um, the, and so um, when I talk about that, I'm talking about the IC1s, uh, they were, there were many more data scientists whose highest degree was a master's degree this year versus last year. So last year we were at 48%, this year we're at 59%. So this supports a couple of trends that we've uh, seen accelerating in the last year or two. Uh, firstly, more people are studying analytics now than ever before. So math, statistics, computer science, engineering, basically all the STEM fields. And I, I think it's uh, a lot of these people are recognizing that um, or, or they're, they're putting as a priority the objective to be better enabled to tackle the, you know, the challenging and the more technology um, driven uh, workforce um, than their workplace than ever before. Um, secondly, uh, there are far greater options now in graduate programs. So master's degrees in predictive analytics or data science are now pretty much found in all universities. Uh, also, lastly, thirdly, uh, boot camps, as Adam mentioned, are also an available option for people to enter the field if they have a solid quantitative foundation. Now also, um, it, it's interesting, some companies have gone to in-house training too. I think, Adam, didn't you hear about that at a company that um, was doing some in-house training? Oh yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing that um, more and more often. I think the um, sort of quality on those programs varies a decent amount, but Companies that do have data science teams already um, a lot of times will help bring their more junior analysts up to speed. Um, we also see companies that will sponsor um, you know, uh, master's degrees and things like that. I think one company was uh, allowing their, their employees to go to the Berkeley Data Science Masters, which is designed for people who are mid-career. Um, so I think that is something we're seeing more and more of. Um, uh, and I think at this point it's still a little more common to sponsor training uh, or pay for a degree rather than actually do it in-house, but that is something that's developing. Yeah. One, of, uh, one of my clients at Nielsen actually was telling me about um, uh, a, a young person that they had hired uh, who happened to be a Cracker Jack Python uh, programmer. Um, and he, so they started doing uh, lunch and learns, and where he was teaching the whole group um, Python. So you know, the, the, because people are, because these people are so difficult to find, um, companies are really trying to figure out different creative ways to bring people up to speed. So, so it's no longer, I guess, it, to 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 move on here. Um, it's no longer the norm to have a PhD and be a data scientist, but it's going to be really interesting for me to see how this might change things into the future and how um, the, the, the jobs are defined. So another really interesting insight we found uh, was again related to the IC1 level, um, and this time it's related to their residency status. Um, this year we saw a pretty sharp increase in the number of U.S. citizens in the group. Uh, so this year's citizens accounted for 57% of the sample compared to only 47% last year. So that's a pretty significant jump. Uh, I think this is another sign of the changing educational interests of young people um, and them coming onto the job market. Now remember what I said earlier about that nerd label going away as quantitative skills kind of go mainstream. And again, I think part of this, um, this, this chart illustrates that really well. So in the past, foreign-born people made up the majority of professionals in data science, and now that's no longer the case. And this was that uh, big shift that I mentioned earlier, so I hope you're all relieved that that cliffhanger isn't uh, up in the air anymore. I know you're all probably anxious. Right, right. So um, finally, data scientists on the coast continue to out-earn those in the middle of the country. So not a big surprise there. 
Now, so this information that I've given given you in the last oh ten minutes has been uh, is really only the tip of the iceberg. Um, so be sure to go to our website and download the full study to get all the details. So what's next? Um, one shift that's taking place, and which we've noticed in our conversations with many data scientists is that they are no longer uniformly interested in going to work for one of the FANG companies, the FANG companies being Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Many data scientists want to build something new. They want to create something of their own. Um, and then the other thing that we hear a lot is that they want to work for a company that's more mission driven, whether that mission is maybe curing cancer or conserving energy or tracking disease. Uh, but the overarching sentiment that we hear from many is that they want to make their own mark. So that said, uh, the giant data science teams at Facebook, Google, and the rest uh, will continue to attract talent. Uh, but for many data scientists, they're no longer the top prize that they used to be just two or three short years ago. And two years ago, I had candidates regularly when I'd ask them, what would your ideal job look like? What are you looking for? Say if they wanted to go to a Facebook. Um, I heard Facebook a lot. I heard Apple a lot, Google obviously. Um, and I don't hear that really very often at all anymore where a candidate will say that Google is their, their ideal I, I, idea of a job. Um, I do hear more often the next Uber or the next Airbnb, and that really goes back to that building something new. Uh, so they don't want to go somewhere where there is this big giant data science infrastructure in place. Uh, they want to go somewhere where they can build something, build a product, uh, and really start from scratch. So some of the industries where the use of uh, data science is still emerging include areas like healthcare, uh, where startups are using artificial intelligence to examine uh, x-rays and MRIs to diagnose problems, lots and lots of applications in healthcare. That's really an exciting area. Um, also, traffic management agencies and, and city planners are using real-time traffic and weather data to figure out um, traffic flow and also to manage emergency response. Yeah, I, I was talking to um, a candidate a few weeks ago who was doing pretty interesting stuff with this. They were using um, it was roadside assistance, and they were using cell phone accelerometers to predict erratic driving um, accidents, figure out how to predict when to send out a dispatcher for roadside assistance before anything even happens. Um, so kind of creepy big brother type stuff, but very interesting. So there's also been a lot of advancements in personalized education, which I think is uh, long overdue. Um, and then areas like FinTech, which uh, Adam mentioned earlier, where consumer lending companies are refining how they're using social networks to assess credit worthiness. And no doubt there's going to be many, many more. And I'm sure in, in the next few years this will get really crazy when all of us switch over to using exclusively Bitcoin uh, for all of our money. <laughs> <laughs> Since you've invested in Bitcoin, <laughs> right, Adam? So anyway, I, you know, I just finished uh, reading an interesting book by Steve Case called The Third Wave. Many of you, it came out just this last uh, month. Um, and it discusses the evolution of the Internet. So what Case lays out are three stages. Um, the first wave is, is when the foundation was getting established. Uh, it was very time consuming, it was risky, it was difficult. So companies like AOL, Apple, Microsoft, IBM, and Yahoo were all part of that. Uh, and then there's many, many more um, that aren't on this list because they failed. So, and then um, came the second wave, and that's social and search networking uh, began to develop. And innovation went a lot more quickly. So these are companies like Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, uh, and so on and so forth. So there were relatively few barriers to get in the way of these businesses. So uh, they were, they, you know, I don't want to say they were easy to erect because that's not true. Um, but um, clearly um, they didn't have nearly the kinds of um, issues and, and problems that uh, uh, companies saw in the first wave. So now we're in the third wave. 
Um, and this is where you have Internet-enabled devices uh, spreading into our everyday lives. So, you know, the Internet of Things, or maybe you could even say the Internet of Everything. So this is going to be another really challenging phase, and it's going to take much more time uh, before it's going to show results. Definitely a lot harder to get your friends to start installing uh, sensors in their houses than to get them to jump onto Facebook because you're doing it. Um, so uh, this is a, a much bigger undertaking. Yeah, it's a wholly, wholly different ball game now. So, um, and, and one reason that it's going to be tough is because there are more challenges with government regulations. Um, let's take Uber as a prime example here. Um, they've been butting heads with regulators as well as labor unions. Uh, but Uber um, has been very successful in overcoming these barriers because they have a very compelling product uh, that consumers really, really want. Another example of workforce resistance issues might be teachers unions versus personalized education. I think that that's going to, uh, to hit pretty hard too. Um, I, I'm sure we've also all run into doctors that are very resistant to electronic medical records. Sometimes I can understand why I kind of understand their concern, but on the other hand, I think the upside for anybody that knows anything about data is, uh, is obvious. So we're bound to see significant disruption in this third wave of innovation, um, and it's, it's bound to be far, far messy, messier and will take years to develop uh, it, than the second wave. There will be uh, far fewer overnight successes, and also there will be a lot more failures. Okay, so this is a slide that I really wanted to use. This is the busiest intersection in the world. It's outside Shibuya, Sta Sh Shibuya Station uh, in Tokyo. Um, I happened to be there just last week, and I just I couldn't believe it. It was just crazy. And, and I unfortunately have not been there, um, but I have seen the YouTube video, so if like me uh, you can't just jump on a plane to Japan this afternoon, you can go on YouTube um, and look this up. I think just world's busiest intersection, something yeah, like that. It um, but it, so it's funny. crazy. Yep, yep, yep. So, but it, it reminds me a bit of the frenzy of activity around data science um, and data-driven decision-making. Um, and, and clearly some of it's hype for sure, um, but it is here to stay. And all of you data scientists listening are in a really good spot. You've picked the right career. Now these next couple of years uh, will clearly be a proving ground um, on many fronts. So first for the freshly assembled data science teams that are being stood up. Uh, secondly, for all the new master's programs and boot camps that are out there and available that need to sort of prove their value. And then lastly, for startups um, that are looking for money and looking to scale and running into uh, the regulatory issues and labor issues that I talked about earlier. So I'm anxious to see how it all plays out. Um, so I hope you've all uh, submitted your questions. Um, but before I turn it back over to Katie to field some of those, um, I'd like to acknowledge and thank both Katie Prezis and Stacy Bosowski um, on my staff here for all the hard work they put together um, they put uh, in putting together this webinar um, as well as the report. Um, they know that I am a very tough taskmaster when it comes to being exact about this kind of thing, right, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so they did a terrific job, um, and I'm very, I'm very proud of um, uh, of the quality of the report and the uh, the output. So, very nicely done, guys. Okay, on to the questions. Thank you, Linda. Um, and we are moments away from our Q&A session, so if you have any additional questions, feel free to send those through to me in the chat box, and I will post them to Linda and Adam in just a minute. Um, but in the meantime, we definitely appreciate you guys sharing all this updated data, Linda and Adam. Um, if you're interested in seeing our complete report, you can download it right now at uh, www.birchworks.com study. There are nearly 40 pages of data and insights in there, so definitely chock full of information. Um, in the next few days, we will also be adding a recording of today's webinar, and our uh, slide deck will also be available there for you to download 
and share with your colleagues. Um, and as Linda mentioned um, at the beginning of our talk, if you're more interested in just general analytics, our predictive analytics study from September is also available at the same link uh, for free download. Um, and are you looking to hire data scientists? Have you been struggling to find the perfect candidate? Is your inbox filling up with data science wannabes? As Adam mentioned, you know, everyone is using this job title. So Adam and Linda would love to spend some time learning about your team and brainstorming about your hiring needs. And as many of you already know, we work on contingency. So we only get paid if we successfully place a candidate with you. Um, and the first 10 people to reach out to us using promo code STUDY will get their first placement free. Okay, well that part's just a joke. But we really would love to connect with you. So um, please email us at clients at birchworks.com to set something up. Okay, so now it's time for what everyone's been waiting for, the Q&A session. So Adam and Linda, we've received some questions already, so let's just jump right in here. Um, we've received a lot of questions about different educational paths for data scientists. Um, so someone specifically asked about if companies actually recognize courses taken from online data science um, academies like Udacity or Coursera. Do companies really put as much weight into that as the traditional educational background? Um, well, like I said earlier, I think those are good ways to pick up um, if you're a programmer, let's say you're a programmer, you're a quantitative analyst already, you have a background in those things, but you haven't used a specific language. Um, so you've been using Java for years, you haven't really gotten into Python yet. I think that you know taking a MOOC on Python could be a good way to transition into that, uh, you know, learning that syntax. Um, if you're interested in something, kind of want to dip your toes and then see what it's like or what kind of projects you might do, it's a good way to check it out. Um, but it, they definitely are not taken uh, with as much weight as a traditional program would be. Um, so I, I've worked with candidates who have done a lot of Coursera courses. Who have a, you know, they've been doing it for years. They have a lot of skills they've built up from it. Um, but even in those most extreme examples where they've done 10 courses, it can be hard to get a hiring manager to really look at that um, and take a chance on hiring you because you are unproven uh, doing that work. One way you can try and get around that is through things like Kaggle competitions. Um, but in general, no, they are not taken with as much weight as a college course. Right. It, it, I will say though for people that are further on in their career, um, and, and this sort of goes back to what I would mentioned earlier, how important it is to stay abreast of changes in the field. Um, it is a great way for you to make sure that you stay familiar with everything that's coming. Um, it's inexpensive. It's hard. It's time consuming, um, but well worth the investment in your long Question. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, another question that we had, maybe Linda, you might be able to speak to this. Are there any industries that are, you know, particularly taking to data science, or are some resisting it, given how kind of disruptive it is to the way businesses operate? Right. I, you know, it's it's um, permeating um, almost every industry. It's been really very. Um, uh, fun to watch over the last year as uh, data science matures. Um, certainly the healthcare industry is one, and that kind of goes hand in hand also with the insurance industry. Um, FinTech was one that we would mentioned where a lot is going on not only in credit but also in Wall Street uh, in really identifying things. It, within the uh, not-for-profit world too, um, you know, they're, we're starting to see data very commonly um, used too. So, um, as well as, of course, in the government. So um, I can't wait until they stop um, um, because there's so many other ways to count the population. But we'll see, I guess. But um, details anyway. But yes, it's it's everywhere, and um, uh, you know, for some for some in advertising, it's kind of old hat. But some of these other areas, it's just really starting to. And groups are, are forming very quickly. 
in, in some in some cases even um, that delay with things like uh, healthcare and finance are more recently than things like advertising getting into the space it wasn't even due to a lack of interest. It was more uh, because of regulations on the data itself. Um, so finances and then healthcare data obviously took a little bit of time. You can't just jump in and do whatever you want with that data uh, because of legal regulations. Thank you both for that. We received a couple questions about the business acumen piece. Um, so are companies searching specifically for industry-specific business acumen? So if you're in healthcare, they want experience in healthcare, or is it more of a general business understanding? Well, business acumen is something that, um, you know, it's, it's hard to um, get a handle on that from somebody's resume. So it really comes out during the course of conversation. What um, um, the thing that, that every hiring manager is looking for in a quantitative person is very curious, who asks a lot of questions, who really wants to understand uh, the context of any sort of data problem that they're working on. So, um, you know, I always advise um, candidates before they're going into an interview to really think about their business and and read about it and come up with questions around that because that curiosity thing really is a good indicator of, uh, of uh, developing business acumen. Now on the client side, you know, it's, it's really important for managers to take the time uh, with their young people, with the ICs, uh, to really develop business acumen, have discussions about the business, make sure you put uh, the problems into context. So, um, it's really on them to bring up, um, you know, as part of a leadership responsibility um, to bring uh, uh, young people up to speed and understanding how important that piece of, um, of their skill set. Great. Hope Thank you, Linda. Yes. Um, another question, um, more kind of on the hiring side. Um, someone asked, you know, I suspect that our team is having trouble hiring data scientists because we're located in kind of the middle of the country, and you had mentioned that, you know, there's higher pay available kind of on the coast. What are some ways that we can maybe boost our appeal? Right, and, and you know, I think that time is going to solve that issue. Again, I think not everybody wants to move to California, and, and we start, started seeing that happen last year. Um, and, and, you know, as the years, within a year or two, um, I think we're going to see a much more even distribution of uh, data scientists across the country. I mean, it's, you know, it's going to dominate still on the West Coast, um, but as these groups pop up, um, and as more young people get into the field through academic programs, um, not everybody wants to live in California. Nobody wants that kind of lifestyle or necessarily wants to work for that kind of So I think that that problem is going to um, uh, be less of an issue going forward now. Great. Thank you, Linda. Um, and we have time for one more question. So. When companies are looking for um, managers, like senior level managers within data science, is there anything in particular that they tend to focus on in terms of skill set that they uh, are looking for? Well, at the senior end, you know, the key is you know, oftentimes when a client comes to me and says, you know, we want a client team, um, so we need somebody to lead them. Um, the, the most important thing that I evaluate is that person's ability to be able to lay out that roadmap and then so that's going to include things like those bridges within the organization which uh, provide guidance um, as well as the idea of, um, uh, of selling in um, the use of analytics on a daily basis. So operationalizing analytics to um, you know, just sort of having all kinds of fancy tools and supports, you really need buy-in from the business units, and that's really about uh, you know developing those relationships across the organization and establishing your credit. So it is in, in many ways that it has a very sales component. Um, additionally, of course, um, your ability to be able to attract talent to the organization as you build your team. 
um, is very, very critical. So again, there's, there's a war for talent out there, as everybody knows. Um, and so your ability to be able to uh, attract uh, a good staff is, is also very, very important. Perfect. Thank you, Linda. Um, well, I think that's all the time we have for questions for today. I'd like to quickly remind you that you can follow Birchworks on social media to stay up to date on the data science market, including our latest research, flash surveys, and blogs. Um, so be sure to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. And keep an eye out for our extremely popular SAS versus R survey. Um, our 2016 installment will be hitting your inbox soon. Well, we appreciate everyone joining us today. Please visit our website, www.birchworks.com/study, to download our new report now. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day.